My name is Craig Gardner, and I work for SUSE, and I uh, hope that you will forgive me, but uh, I, I certainly want to, to provide for you a quality of experience where we'll talk uh, not just about SUSE uh, information regarding hardening and tweaking your Linux server, but uh, most of my experience uh, with SUSE Linux is going to be what's principally going to inform the, the, the content that we have here. But it's a, an attempt to make it as universal as possible to be as meaningful to you and helpful to you as is possible. As we were kind of joking for the uh, several minutes before the meeting started, uh, security is something that people lose a lot of sleep over, and rightly so. And what I hope that we will accomplish today is give you an opportunity to analyze and think about a few things that maybe you haven't thought of before, but that may uh, provide for you some uh, some better content sleep. I'm not going to solve your sleeping problems, but going to try and make it a little bit easier for you to sleep peacefully and to reduce the amount of risk that's going on with you and your Linux servers. Uh, I usually, when I give this presentation, I have basically the room divided into two categories of people, and not that it's evenly divided, obviously, but I usually have people who are executives or directors or similar to that who are in charge of security policy and implementing security measures within a company and organization. And the other set are those who are system administrators and uh, that are in charge of implementing those security policies and making sure that where the rubber hits the road, that the rubber is actually hitting the road and that you're not careening and skidding off the road and losing control of the vehicle. So it, are, are any of you here that would be uh, in the first category there that are in charge of security policy. Oh, that's a relief. Thank you very much. And others of you that would be more in the lines of a system administrator who's in charge of securing the systems. Yeah. And so some of you didn't raise, so you're probably in the other category or you're sleeping, and that's fine. Either way. <laughs> if, if at any point during this presentation this isn't meeting your needs, don't feel that you're offending me if you want to stand up and walk out. That's perfectly fine. And I would also like to know, not, not while you stand up and curse, saying I'm wasting my time here, but uh, if later on that you would go onto the, the website, is it join in? I can't remember what it's called. Join dot in? It is join in. Okay. And uh, to tell me what you think. Tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what you think would have been better uh, or was, uh, uh, was great. I'd love to hear if you thought it was great. But we're going to be talking today not about some exhaustive list of all the things that you need to do in order to make sure that your systems are secure. We only have about 50 minutes, 55 minutes, so we can't do that. I want to challenge your thinking. I want to perhaps get you thinking about things that you haven't thought of before and get you in a position that maybe you can make some adjustments to how you are approaching your security in your organization. Uh, we'll start with talking about the what's and why's of system security. We'll also talk, talk about uh, the inspection of a system and preparing and de de deploying some of those considerations that go on there. And then we'll talk a little bit about the tools that are involved. And uh, like I said, we're not going to be able to talk about everything. And if there's something specific that we don't mention, I apologize in advance. We're going to skim over an awful lot of these things here. What should security be? Oh, before I get going there, regarding that last slide, uh, one thing that I want to be clear about, and it's one thing that uh, under other circumstances, I have other kinds of presentations and colleagues of mine have similar presentations. We're really talking about individual system deployment. And I know for most of you, you're, you're, you're worried more about the thousands or hundreds of machines that you're trying to secure. And that's really beyond the scope of this presentation today. We're really talking about some individual or onesie twosie kind of deployments where some more advanced tools and different methodologies and different considerations will be involved when you're talking about an entire infrastructure of servers. So what should security be? I'm going to tell you that what you see exactly on the screen, it's worth my reciting it to you. This is an important takeaway. Good software does exactly what you expect it to do and does it well. Secure software is what is listed above and does only that. Nothing more, nothing less. Does that ring true to you? Okay. So 
because we're talking about software, and software by its very definition is always going to have bugs. I'm sorry if I keep walking to the point that you can't see. Software is always going to have deficiencies, shortcomings, bugs. And that is one of the primary causes of insecure software. It's not the only cause, but it's a significant one. You're going to have things that are going to cause your software to not function the way that it was designed to do so. And the, one of the things that takes place, in addition to uh, having other uh, unexpected and undesired side effects of buggy code, of course, you've got the crashes that are going to take place, but you're also going to occasionally have vulnerabilities exposed due to the software having a bug. And when you have those vulnerabilities, you are going to experience one or more of these different things listed at the bottom. What I want you to remember to do, and it's something that a lot of our proprietary software brothers and sisters try to avoid, but that we in a free and open source software environment encourage substantially is the way to address the software vulnerability problem and the other uh, undesirable characteristics of buggy software is to always apply your maintenance updates. In an open source environment where you have a community of people who are motivated and who are uh, very talented and depending on the size of the community, the number of eyes that are inspecting the software is significant. You have the greatest opportunity to shut down these undesirable characteristics by keeping your software up to date. Yes, there is always a risk that a newer update is going to come out that's going to result in one or more of those other things up there. But the general statistical uh, representation of the redu reduction of risk comes from keeping your software up to date. Please apply your maintenance updates. And now I know that's not always an easy thing to do. Many of you live in a, in a, a corporate world where you have uh, someone dictating that you only have a very limited and narrow window of opportunity wherein that you can apply your maintenance updates. But to the extent that you're able, and to the extent that you are aware and keeping your eye on these security vulnerabilities and other shortcomings of the software, please keep your software up to date. You run the best chance of reducing your risk. Now, there are a whole bunch of other things that we could be talking about as we explore the, uh, the important aspects of securing your SUSE Linux enterprise system or even your regular everyday uh, uh, community uh, administered or a, a, a hobbyist server uh, that we could talk about how to keep it safe from being hacked or being uh, vulnerable to, to other types of security def uh, deficiencies. We're really going to concentrate, though, in the time that we have on this bottom part, the deployment and installation, the considerations that go into deployment and installation, the configuration or hardening of those particular services that you have, the monitoring, maintenance, and then, of course, plans for decommissioning your services. That's what we'll be talking about today. So uh, one thing that uh, this slide might say is inspection, but I want to, to uh, talk more specifically about the introspection, the fact that you need to put some thought, preparation, and planning into these things before you deploy it. Lots of times we think, oh, all I have to do is install the base system, throw the image out there, have it run, and I don't need to worry about it anymore. But the better you plan as to what it is you're going to do with this server, the lower the risk you will have when the system is deployed and in the wild. So here's one thing that I want to mention that perhaps you haven't thought of. If you have, that's very good, and I applaud you. But uh, as you can see here, kind of a standard uh, uh, graphical representation of how you might have your network set up, your services uh, that are customer-facing or outward-facing or here out in this de uh, demilitarized zone. Then you have an intermediary network that then constant, that uh, allows you access to all of your back-end services, your back-office servers that are involved there. The thing that I want to mention to you is this green circle, down, not a circle, uh, ellipsis, uh, ellipse, what do you call it? Elliptical, yeah, ellipse. Uh, down here in the bottom right. One thing that having a separate dedicated administrative network does for you. I'll mention two of them. 
The number one is if you have things that are being compromised out here and you have them all on, on this, this uh, external network and that's the only network that you have or you have something else going on here in your production network that represents a security vulnerability or an exploit that is, being, that is taking place or a denial of service that is shutting things down here in any of these environments, you still want to be able to get to your servers that you're administrating. You'll want to be able to have an administrative mechanism for accessing those servers to shut them down or to turn off services or to investigate the, uh, the exploitation that's taking place. The second thing that you accomplish by having your own separate uh, individual, uh, somewhat isolated administrative network is, this is where you should be doing all of your development work. This is where you'll be setting up new servers and testing for vulnerabilities in that environment before you deploy them out into a production area. This is where you play with things and make sure you've got the settings right, the way that you want them to be. Yes? So you could think of it that way. If it's out of band, then, then it kind of defeats that first purpose that I was talking about, where you want to be able to access those services if this production network goes down. Yes. So you can think of it in a variety of different ways, and you can do what's, what works best for you. But my emphasis here is to make sure that you've got something here where you can be doing all of your planning and preparation in a safe environment that's not going to cause problems for your customers or for your organization before you actually put the server into play. Thanks for that question. Okay, so now let's go through then this planning phase. This is actually the, we're going to go through an installation here, but these are the things that you might consider before you go through these steps. So the first sort of thing that you have going on here, this is a SUSE Linux Enterprise installation here with using a, an X uh, display here rather than command line, but just for a, for a ability to display it conveniently for you here, you have all of the packages that are going to be installed. So when we talk about package selection, how does that play into our security considerations? Anyone? Was that a raised hand? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, only install good software, software that you use, that you trust. Good. Another thought? Only install what you're actually going to use on that particular server. What's said differently and, and an excellent observation. And you've used the exact example that I often use. That's so easy for us to just think, oh, well, what's wrong with me installing Apache on here? Maybe I'm going to end up using a web service on here. If you don't have a plan to use that particular service on this particular server, don't install it. It's a liability if you do. Thanks. Anyone else? Any other thoughts about package selection? I would also mention that you want to make sure that uh, this good gentleman here was talking about only installing good software. And I want to elaborate on that a little bit. I think he's exactly right. You only want to install that software that comes from a source that you trust. You don't want to be downloading and installing software that you just saw uh, somewhere on this one particular web page that said that they had an RPM for it and I'm going to go ahead and download and install it. Or uh, you've got a D package, a Debian package that's out there and you think, oh, well, this looks cool. I'm going to, uh, to download it and install it. Get only the software that you trust and it comes from a reputable source. That will substantially reduce your security risk. Any other thoughts before we move on from package selection? Yeah. I remember that. That's an excellent question, and and uh, uh, let me let me answer your question in a different way than where you're probing, but then we'll extrapolate from that some other bits of data. In again, I can speak very clearly from a SUSE perspective because I work there. And as a matter of fact, one of my chief responsibilities at SUSE is I do a. It wouldn't be fair to call it a code review, because I don't 
I'm not the one who actually reviews every line of code that goes into OpenSUSE or the SUSE products. But I do perform an auditing function where I am one of the reviewers that looks to see what is being submitted, looks to make sure that the code itself looks sane compared to the comments that are made in the change log, and that the change log matches likewise the reverse direction, the source code, so that there's some sanity checking that goes on there. The more you trust the processes that your distribution goes through, the lower the risk that you have. Whatever happened with the WordPress, I, I remember it happening, but I can't remember the details. But again, that was a, a case where there wasn't the, the same quality of process that was being followed that introduced those builds out to customers. Any other thoughts? Yes. That's an excellent observation. Yeah. Fantastic and, and well said. Thank you very much for sharing that. Exactly. The kinds of processes that I was talking about regarding SUSE. Excellent observation. Now, if we were all the very finest engineers and we had no trust in anybody else, one of the great features of open source is that we could go get the sources ourselves, read the sources for every component that we're going to install, compile it ourselves in our own isolated, you know, I'm starting to get ridiculous. I hope you're identifying that. There's going to be a time where you're going to have to manage your risk based on your time and expertise that, that are available. And I'm trying to help that we can just have these things in our mind and consider them as we go through these activities. Reducing the number of repositories that we come from and perhaps settling for things that have already been vetted through other processes are excellent, excellent suggestions that reduce the risk. But knowing, knowing for sure that the only truly secure system is the machine that does not have a keyboard and does not have a network connection then it becomes entirely unusable. And you have to come to a, a risk management decision as to how much risk you're willing to take based on uh, the time and the expertise that you have available to you. Great. So moving on from package selection, password management. Okay, again, this happens to be SUSE Linux Enterprise. This is uh, SLE 11. And uh, one of the recent versions, I think it is SP2, which is... Uh, no, this one is SP1. This is SLE 11 SP1. I think I took this slide here. And notice that for this particular installation that we have Blowfish here, uh, anybody want to tell me uh, why I wouldn't select, say, DES for my password encryption on my, SUSE, my uh, Linux Enterprise system? Any thoughts? Yes. No, that's not true. Uh, DES can certainly support 256 characters of passwords. But I can't remember which one it is that has that limit limitation. But we have had DES uh, compromised. DES can be routinely cracked now. It's, it doesn't require a very sophisticated uh, computer with, with a very powerful processor anymore. It's just a matter of time how long it can be done. And this was cracked, uh, I believe, back in 99. Maybe it was, no, it was later than that. I'm getting my dates mixed up with something. But in the early 2000s, it was cracked by big, huge, honk, and sophisticated computers. But now it's rather routinely cracked. So if someone ever gets, an, an, uh, gets a hold of your shadow password file, with some processing power and enough patience, 
they could crack DES password. Anybody know a good reason to to use DES instead of one of these others? Any other, any thoughts on being required to use DES? It is very fast, definitely. Oh, absolutely. It's probably on par with MD5, but uh, it's uh, it's very easy to decrypt. Yep, when it's properly salted, when you, when you intend it to be decrypted. All three of these uh, the countries that I know of, and France is usually the most restrictive, you can certainly use those. So I would say, and this is a bit of a trick question, forgive me then for throwing this in, but uh, if you were in an NIS environment and you were Linux only, you could still use Blowfish if you wanted to. Uh, but if you are in an NIS environment where you have other Nixes in, uh, installed in your NIS scheme, like Solaris, Solaris doesn't have Blowfish or MD5 for that matter. You are limited to, yes, the, Solaris does have those capabilities, but not in NIS. So you would have to use DES if you wanted to share passwords across those disparate systems. Um, what's blatantly missing from this list of encryption has SHA, particularly the SHA-2 family, 256 and 512. And uh, other distributions will have this. You can install the SHA-2 family on SLES uh, as an as an add-on, as a different package, uh, and it comes native in later versions of this. For this particular uh, demonstration, it's, it looks like it's a very limited and uh, and uh, not desirable implementation of uh, Linux. But uh, there are later versions. I just don't have it on this particular screen. And I need to update it so that you don't lose confidence in SUSE Linux. But yeah, SHA-2 would be the best that you could choose right now. That'd be a great choice. Okay, any other thoughts then about password management? Anybody else wants to share? Yes. <laughs> Good. So in this particular example for this screenshot, there are not very many characters. If you really wanted to have a more secure deployment of your server, you would want to set in your password. For this, If you were to click on expert options, you could actually create there a rule that will require not only the you know, root can always break all rules. It would require that that could allow those other users, those unprivileged users on this system, to have more sophisticated passwords, longer than eight characters, or with a, a you know, mixture of a camel case, or with letters, or other characters. That would be a great policy. Again, you need to manage your risk with your usability, right? If you're going to require every user on the system to have a password of 128 characters. Your system's not going to be very usable. It'll be very secure, but not very usable. Yeah? The short answer is yes. Yes. There, again, if you are in an NIS environment, there are different limitations that you would have, you'd be subjected to. But that's an excellent suggestion. Very. A uh, good suggestion for greater security. It's not horrendously more secure, but it is measurably more secure to have pass raises. The challenge there, though, is by standard Linux rules that we currently have implemented, there is no way to enforce that. You would have to enforce, you'd have to encourage that by policy in your organization. All right, moving along. Uh, the next one, why didn't, I've somehow lost the title of this screen, I'm sorry. When you are setting up your host name, what's a, some security-oriented consideration that you would have from this screen? And for those of you who are not familiar with SUSE Linux, I'm sorry if this is an unfamiliar screen. But in principle, you'll understand this as you look closely at what's happening here. You're going to give this host a name and a domain. And then there are two checkboxes here, one that which has a checkbox next, it, next to it, which in this particular installation is the default value to change the host name via DHCP, and then another checkbox here that says assign host name to the loopback IP address. Is there a security challenge that's associated with this that you could think of? Yeah. If you see in the 
the uh, sets of tables that you've, that you've generated for yourself or that you've pilfered from some other system. You see a box that says uh, uh, Windows Oracle 2000. This is the host name. You know a ton already about what kind of system it is that you're trying to attack and what its potential vulnerabilities are. Great observation. You don't want this to necessarily have your host names to be giving away more information than you're willing to part with. Yeah? That, that's a very good suggestion. However, let me again, I'm not trying to tell you not to do this, but a security consideration here is, do you really want to be calling your system NS1? What information are you giving away to a potential hacker? You know that it's the name service, and you, if that's what you're after, it's easier for you to attack it. Yeah, again, I'm not arguing. The point that you're making is still very well made. So in the interest of time, I will mention here, you don't want to have DHCP in charge of naming your hosts. Because there are a lot of, unfortunately, services, network-oriented services, that depend upon specific host names. And, and we could say that that's less secure, uh, but that's a different discussion altogether. But that if you, if you are a hacker and you get control of the DHCP service, and you have hosts that can have their names changed based on what the DNA, DHCP server says that the host name is supposed to be for that MAC address, then you can now have a, a measure of control over hosts in that network and a measure of control over services in that network. So I would recommend to you, similar to the suggestion that was made about making sure that your host names don't give away too much information, but that you not let DHCP control what this host name is. You'll have more control over it and it'll be less of a security vulnerability. Yes. That's an even better point to make. That's a great suggestion, that one that I wouldn't have made here. If you really are a server and you are trying to provide those kinds of services that you would associate most readily with being a production server, you wouldn't want to have it named or, or address given to it by way of DHCP anyway. I agree with that point. Thank you. You'd want to have a static address and hence a static host name. Good. Next slide. Network services. Are there anything here on this screen that uh, you might consider has security implications? Implications. I'm sorry, it's not easy to see. Anybody else? Okay, I'm happy to go to you. I just want to give someone else a chance if they had it. Very good. Now let's be wise to the realities of that even though we're being dragged kicking and screaming into the IPv6 world, IPv6, if you're not using it, shut it off. If you've got the interface enabled and the protocol enabled for IPv6, it's just a security vulnerability that someone can exploit. If you're not going to use it, turn it off. If you are going to use it, Make sure that you're using it properly. We had a previous session that talked a little bit about that. You need to make sure that you are putting the same security considerations into your network configuration for the V6 protocol as you are for V4. Anything else on the screen that has to do with security? That's never the first one, but thanks for bringing that up. I'm, you're, you're defying the odds. Good. That's another good one. Boy. Well, let's see, where is it? Right here. Yep. That particular interface is configured with DHCP. Now, the default for SUSE Linux Enterprise is to come up with that DHCP assigned. And that's generally the thought behind it. And I'm not the one who comes up with the use cases for these. That's those darn product managers that do it. That uh, the use case is that you want it DHCP when you're initially setting it up because that's the easiest way to get in an IP before you actually deploy it. And I don't agree with that, but that's the thought process that goes into that. 
definitely you want to change this to be static if you want to have an, a more secure system. Any other thoughts? Yeah. That would be better. That's a good idea, yes. That would be a more secure uh, implementation. Again, that's de beyond the scope of an individual server installation. That would be a more of a network uh, configuration capability. But I agree with that. If you have your, uh, your IT organization putting those kinds of restrictions on DHCP assignments, then that would be a more secure solution. Yes? That's a good thought, yeah, cause, because SSH has uh, uh, incorporated in it some measure of, of, uh, of more secure communication between the client and the server. You've got, you've got every transaction is encrypted, all the transaction is encrypted with keys. It's great. You want to have a secure, you wouldn't want to have a Telnet open, right? And I assure you that Telnet is, doesn't even measure into the equation. It's not even uh, turned on in, in this particular environment, nor is it on any other server that I've ever installed. Uh, not in the modern age, yes. Good observation. The reason that this is closed is because there is some thought that you are going to enable this later, or if it, because it's a server, perhaps you are managing it through some other management software, which we would also presume would be encrypted transactions, or that perhaps you're going to be controlling it through some uh, uh, remote console mechanism like IPME or something like that. Uh, IPMI. Sorry, I spoke. My majority of my team is in Germany, and they all call it IPMI instead of IPMI. So does everybody know what IPMI is? R remote, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a serial console emulation mechanism that exists on most servers that are, are deployed these days that allows you to connect uh, over a, a broad serial mechanism, you know, a multiplexer of serial ports into the, the individual machine for configuration or management. I forget what IPMI stands for. Anybody? Anybody? It does mean a management interface, but I can't remember what the IP stands for. Yeah, could be. All right, no one has said the one that is almost always the first. I'm surprised that you do it, and particularly considering the previous sessions that we've had here. Uh, the, the one just before this one was talking about the firewall. Oops, am I pointing to it right there? Firewall. It is enabled. So we definitely want to have the firewall enabled by default, right? Can anybody think of a reason why you wouldn't want to have the firewall enabled? Oh, there's a moment of hesitation in the back there. It is a trick question. I'm going to challenge that conventional wisdom about firewalls. And I do so firmly in the face, talking behind his back, of... Jason, what was his name now? I wrote it now. The guy who gave the previous presentation, X Jason Butters. He's smart, guys. I got to tell you, when it comes to IP tables, that guy knows what he's talking about. And there are lots of people that are likewise smart about IP tables. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of a shallow guy about IP tables. But I got to tell you right here, and he's recording the statement I'm making, and I'm going on record publicly saying, consider, my friends, turning the firewall off. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I'm not telling you that it's the right answer for all circumstances. I'm not trying to tell you that there shouldn't be firewalls in your infrastructure. But for your individual servers, I would suggest that you consider not running a firewall. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. So turn it off. And we'll get to that in a little more detail in a minute. Okay, for the sake of time, we've got to split fast through here. Um, one of the great things, to forgive my shameless selling of SUSE Linux, one of the great capabilities of SUSE Linux that I have not seen in Ubuntu Server. In Ubuntu Server, uh, sell, there's a lot of sales of Ubuntu. Uh, their concentration, their focus is on their, uh, their consumer product and Unity and Mirror. And they're not as worried about 
putting on fancy bells and whistles on the server product. And Red Hat is a great product, and I, I certainly would recommend that you give serious consideration to, to Red Hat, particularly the Red Hat uh, commercial product, and not necessarily, and Fedora is fine too, I'm not trying to bash Fedora. But in terms of security considerations, Red Hat's where it's at, they do a good job. One thing that SUSE Linux provides for you here is a tool that will help you, the common man, or even the sophisticated security system administrator, to go through some of the security considerations for your server. If you open up the YAST tool and you select the, uh, uh, where's my button? The security and users section, which brings you to this point here. And in this section, you have a lot of the th things that we've kind of been looking at here the last few screens. And uh, you know, like we didn't talk about the CA management, but that's got security implications. And you've got the common server certificate, which if you ask me is absolutely worthless, but we'll skip over that right now. Firewall we'll talk about in a minute. You've got laugh. Auditing is a really good, important thing about security. You've got sudo. Sudo is a great tool that helps you to, to enable users to do a variety of elevated things without having to give them entire root privileges. That's security oriented. And of course, user and group management, there's security implications there. We talk about passwords. But the thing that's unique here to SUSE Linux is this local security widget. And that will bring up this security overview on your screen that walks you through a boatload of security considerations. And we have over here this navigation panel on the left that will walk you through several of these different things that are related to security. And the top one there is the security overview. And on the left side of the, the column there, the left column, talk about magic sysrec keys. Do you know magic sysrec keys are one of the cleverest, most useful things that these guys have ever come up with for us system administrators to troubleshoot problems that happen on those systems? But it's a huge security risk. And this over here is a help panel that you can click on that will bring up some brief help that will give you an idea of why it's a security risk but then we'll point you to more sophisticated, more lengthy information if you choose to go look at it to teach you about SysRec and how you might use it and how you might variably use it and why it's a security risk. Then on this co column right here, we've put a green check mark for those things that are in the state that we recommend is the most secure. So in the disabled state, even though you lose the ability to debug your system if it goes down, you're in the more secure state if it's disabled. And all of these different things, and oh, I thought there was a, a, a scroll bar here. I, apparently that's all there is on that particular screen. Yep, I think that is. But that can walk you through each one of those things there. And that's not the only one. Notice, I, remember I said that there were these other things here, like the password settings that we talked about earlier. And it will give you a detailed overview, recommendations, and thoughts about what's best, what you should be considering for your secure system and uh, uh, how to add users and what the defaults are going to be, all these different things. This is a great tool to walk you through this. If you already know all the security things that exist and all the other considerations that you want to make, then this is just a little extra fluff. But to organize all of this into one comprehensive tool to guide you through considerations that will affect your security risk is a really helpful thing. Could Ubuntu or Red Hat or any of the other Linux distributions do this? Absolutely. Do any of them do it yet? No, they don't. I think this is a helpful thing for those of us who need to learn more and who are worried and sleep not so well at night, worrying that our systems aren't as secure as they could be. Okay. Um, wow, we're running out of time quickly. We have on this screen something that we could spend a lot of time talking about but won't. And I will summarize this by saying that one of the fantastic and really brilliant capabilities of the Linux kernel is how it so adequately and remarkably isolates the user space from the kernel space and that allows very rigid rules and very precise APIs for access from user space into the kernel. Now, of course, 
if root can do anything, if root is able to have access into this system, or root, root is able to be compromised by a, a, an exploiter, then the rest of your kernel is also is at, is at risk. But with wonderful, but not perfect, with wonderful accuracy, we are able to, through this uh, tremendous design, able to isolate the kinds of damage that takes place when a system is exploited in a non -privileged, by a non-privileged user. In the user space, as long as the, the system is, is uh, set up and configured and hardened in such a way that uh, unprivileged users cannot get privileged rights of root, then you uh, will do a lot. You will be in a great shape to ensuring the long-term viability and runtime of this particular uh, Linux system. When you're making security considerations, you need to think of things in an ordered way as if you were a potential hacker, someone who might do bad to your system, starting from the outside and going all the way down into the kernel. So let's talk about some of those things that you will consider, that you should consider, as you are getting ready to deploy, install, install and deploy this particular system, starting with the network. So uh, as we mentioned on one of the earlier screens, are all of your interfaces going to be used? Most servers come with how many Ethernet ports nowadays? At least two. Many of them come with four and even more ports these days because it's so cheap for them to manufacture it and they're tired of people whining about not having enough. But those are a liability. If, if you have anybody that is able to compromise your physical security and gain access to your system and plug into one of your ports, and your port is just enabled listening by default, that's a security vulnerability. Shut off those interfaces that you're not actually going to use. In many cases, that requires you going into the BIOS and turning them off. But in some cases, the, the, uh, the hardware layer is accessible from certain uh, software drivers that allow you to turn them off. And I would recommend that you do that. Use only those physical interfaces that you're planning, or enable only those ones that you're planning to use. Um, IP forwarding. Okay. If, if your machine is going to be a firewall, then you probably won't want it to have IP forwarding turn on. If it's uh, fronting a NAT, you probably want to have the forwarding capability turn on. You have to. If you're not going to be forwarding traffic, Turn off IP forwarding. It may not necessarily be a liability to this one individual system, but by forwarding someone else's attack through you into some, onto some other network, some other host on the network, then you're facilitating the compromise of some other system within your infrastructure. So just turn it off. Um, net filter rules. Okay? This is exactly what I was talking about before. We'll talk a little bit more on the very next screen about this thing where I'm recommending that you just turn off the firewall on your servers. We'll talk about that in just a second. But other things that you might consider and that we won't have time to talk about is making sure that you know the transaction queue length is an appropriate size and, and that you've got your MTU sets so that you're not going out too far beyond what it is you intend to be uh, communicating. ICMP replies, might as well turn off ping. Uh, no reason for p people to be pinging. Again, your situations may vary. You may need to have ping involved, and then you need to make those considerations for you. But you're a little more secure if you turn that off. If people don't even aren't able to ping your system, it's less of a target to be hacked. All right, we'll move on here to the the uh, discussion about about firewalls. If you take my recommendation of turning off the firewall, what you're saying is, I am confident that what I am intending to be serving from this server is what is actually available, nothing more and nothing less. And you can test that rather trivially by on an external host, oh, come back, on an external host, on a, not the host that you're working on right now, on some other one that's adjacent to it in the network, you run Nmap. And uh, this is a sample set of switches and then the IP address that you have of this particular server. And Nmap will tell you exactly what ports it thinks are open. Then on your system that you're installing, you run a netstat. If they don't agree, then you need to solve the problem and make sure that they do agree. You need to find out why a particular host 
is being uh, a particular port is being shown as being available by net nmap that netstat doesn't think is open and of course if netstat doesn't think it's open it's either a hacked version of N of a netstat <laughs> or something is wrong something is seriously wrong and something that will need to be solved both need to be solved once you are confident that these two outputs are consistent there's no reason for a firewall and I'm not trying to badmouth firewalls in general because they have a role they have a specific purpose and they have a place perhaps in other parts of your infrastructure but uh, if you're trusting if you simply say I have my firewall on and it shows me that through my firewall uh, GUI that there's a configuration GUI that these ports are open and the rest of the ones are closed and that's all that you believe in you're taking a big risk and not that you're trying to show that you have a lack of faith in your firewall implementation or the, or the producers of your firewall or that something is innately wrong with net with the IP tables or net filter it's that you if you're really concerned about security you'll want to just have the confidence that what ports are open are the ones that you intend to have open which is all the firewall is doing anyway. If those ports aren't open and you're getting all of those hits that your firewall is trying to analyze through net filter, it's slowing your system down, not significantly, but it does have an impact on your performance. Your question or thought? That is true. That's also true. Other Yes. And if you are at the point that you are suspecting that there might be an attack, or if you're trying to piece things together after the fact, then it is nice to have those kinds of logs. There are other ways to log that that aren't necessarily uh, that aren't necessarily the performance hit that NetFilter may be, depending on the sophistication of your your IP tables that you have set up. Yeah. But that's a good thought. So you may want to have, you will certainly want to have a firewall up here, and maybe that's you know a Cisco de dedicated type of firewall, or you have firewall capabilities on these servers that are in the DMZ that are fronting the traffic that is going on up here. And I'm not trying to say that they're one size fits all, and that this is a universal recommendation. This is something that you should consider as you are thinking about your security. You had another thought? Okay. Okay. So don't neglect the UDP. Make sure that you understand the UDP is just as hackable as TCP is. And of course, we already talked a little bit about IPv6. Make sure that you're not neglecting. If you're using IPv6, your IPv6 protocol is just as hackable as, P, as a, a V4 is. OK, services. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Disable all the services that are not needed and permanently. Perhaps even consider removing the package altogether, although there are times, unfortunately, there are times where packaging mechanisms pull in spurious and extraneous other bits of software. You want to pay attention to that when you install new software on a server. Make sure it's not pulling in things that you recognize as being something you may not necessarily want. It may have been an oversight that package X uh, is pulling in Apache, but it isn't actually going to run Apache. And then Apache is there, and then it's a vulnerability. Um, if you really want to disable those particular services, you might j just simply do an inserve dash, dash r, or you may just remove the uh, links altogether. And uh, that's more of a system administration headache than anything else. So I don't necessarily recommend that you do that. And make sure that you stop it. And don't take for granted that just running the stop command for that init script is actually going to stop it. Let's see, system D users, it's, all, it's still the same, same in principle, even though we're talking about init v right here. You need to look at the, post, the process list and make sure that the service really is dead. 
Speaking of processes, you don't want to become intimately familiar with all of the processes that you're running. And if you see a process on there that you don't recognize, and if, you, for example, you're running in an RPM uh, environment, then you can use the RPM database to verify what that particular process belongs to, what package it belongs to. Be aware of what's running so that the next time that, you, that you're looking at the system that you think that there's something wrong, you would be able to spot, recognize what it is. Perhaps you might even want to keep a little database of what you see, just a, you know, a text file every so often saved off the, the listing of your process list so that you can know when things change or how they have changed or something that's now running that wasn't running before and investigate it. File security. We had a session earlier today about file integrity management and uh, that's certainly something that you want to consider. We had a long discussion about AID, which is the Advanced Intrusion Detection uh, Environment, which really doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, intrusion detection, and it's not terribly advanced either. But it does keep a database of the files and all of the attributes that each of the files has on your system. And then you might keep that particular set of information stored off box so that you can come back and verify later that files have changed and how they might have changed and how an intrusion might be taking place based on the addition of software or elevated privileges like a uh, sticky bit set on a particular file that you didn't intend to or that you shouldn't have. RPM can do the same sort of thing. If you print out the RPM file database and keep a copy of that off box that you can compare to later, you'd be in very good shape like this right, recommends right here. All right, I'm flying now because we're almost out of time. Use App Armor. Now, in an Ubuntu or Debian circumstance or in SUSE circumstances, you'll use App Armor. Uh, you would all, uh, be confronted with the possibility of using SE Linux, which is conceptually the same but entirely different on a Red Hat environment. And other Linuxes use uh, different variations of this. But this is a way to isolate runtime run spaces in cheroots uh, natively for any system, not just the ones that are out for, outfitted for it. Uh, by default, like NTP. Everybody knows that NTP runs in a nice cheroot, which makes it somewhat more secure. But you can isolate into run spaces those things according to these templates that uh, make it very easy for you to isolate what, a, what a, a bit of software is doing. And if it ever tries to violate that, it will either crash or, or uh, elevate for you an alert saying, I, I'm trying to do something that you haven't configured for me to do. Um, there's no time to talk about this, but App Armor is easier to implement, easier to audit. It's not as complicated. SE Linux is a little bit more secure, far more comprehensive, and it's just really hard to use. So, none of them are a golden hammer. Uh, it's just more tools that are available to you to help you be a little more secure. All I can say is, 18, what happened to 16? Okay. Some of the tools that you should use uh, from a SUSE perspective, uh, the security center we talked about, YAST has an app armor, or SUSE has an app armor profile generator in YAST. Recommend that you use these things for file integrity. Nmap's a fantastic tool. And uh, you know there are lots of different vulnerability scanners. Nessus is, is fine, but we kind of like OpenVAS, and that's really good. And here's a resource that you should become familiar with. Sorry it's so long, maybe I should put a bit.ly there, but it doesn't, it isn't meaning for you, meaningful for you unless I put these slides out here, which I commit to do. Okay, next one, Ubuntu. Likewise, what I've had printed on the bottom for the SUSE Linux one, there are these two really helpful uh, resources that are available. That, uh, and, and let me just emphasize that. For all of the, the uh, propaganda that exists that Red Hat and SUSE and Ubuntu Canonical are all at odds and we're all trying to beat each other up and win each other's marketing space and, and steal customers away from each other, which they all are. Let me assure you, from an engineering perspective, Red Hat and SUSE get along really well. A lot of the information that you'll find in these guides, as, as Linux always is, we steal from each other, we reuse each other's stuff. And that has made these security guides all the more helpful universally across all Linuxes. So you look at these guides. These are really good. Uh, again, AppArmor, Aid, uh, 
uh, can't use RPM there, and dpackage doesn't do quite as good a job of helping you know which file. Sh it doesn't have a database of all of the different files and their permissions and their, the, 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 the like of that. Nmap is obviously always a great port scanner, and Ubuntu has a really, really good vulnerability detector called Tiger. If anybody knows about Tiger, it's, it's good. It's good. Um, and then same sort of thing here for Red Hat. That's their too long URL. And uh, SE Linux instead of App Armor. Same sorts of things. Nmap. And they recommend Nessus and Vlad. So we're out of time. But guys, make it fun. Enjoy Linux. Enjoy your job. Do what you need to do so that you like doing what it is that you do. It's not always easy. But Linux is supposed to be about making your life better, making the world a better place, and have some fun while you're doing it and try to make it more secure. Thanks, everybody.